the same gentry mount. Do you hear me well? Yeah. Good. So, um, I would like to start with expressing my deep gratitude to organizers of this meeting and uh, Professor Felicia in particular. Thanks for your kind invitation to speak. And uh, uh, I'm very thankful to American Society for Microbiology, of which I am a member, uh, and to Galina in particular, who supported my participation in this meeting. So today I am a representative of this uh, renowned society. Uh, my talk today is actually very risky because I'm going to cover the entire evolutionary history of viruses. And I should warn you that, of course, in 40 minutes, my only chance is to do it from a conceptual point of view, to only speaking about most general events and tendencies in virus evolution. It's impossible to go into some particular cases or groups in this format. Anyway, next slide, please. So I'm 40 years, more than 40 years in this business, and uh, I should confess that first 30 years were interesting, engaging, but a bit gradual. Okay, progress was gradual. And like 10 years ago, a little longer, uh, what happened is what I call a big bang in uh, in virology, uh, with uh, with emergence of mass uh, nucleotide sequencing and new disciplines like metagenomics, our view of virology changed quite dramatically. And uh, I'm not going to follow through all of these major events which happened, started happening, uh, started happening like 10 years ago. But uh, in brief, uh, a staggering variety of previously unimaginable viruses were discovered. And we understood that viruses actually dominate the virus. And that's only one aspect of this revolution in virology. Another aspect is not of, uh, not of only statistical, uh, sorry, scientific significance, but more of a direct impact on human society. I'm talking about novel viruses which emerge at frightening pace recently. Everybody knows what is SARS, Ebola, MERS, uh, blue flu uh, derived from birds, bird flu, and of course uh, newcomers such as Zika. Everybody is worrying about it. So this is another challenge to virology, not only to understand how viruses evolve, but how and why they uh, go from species to species and cause this uh, horrible epidemics and pandemics of prison. Next slide. So that is one of my favorite slides I designed myself. What you see here is one milliliter of seawater, which may contain one minnow, tiny fish, and of course, minnows of bacteria. However, this same milliliter of seawater contains anywhere from 1 million to 1 billion virus particles. Okay? And same is true for fresh water, your ponds or lakes or rivers, other streams. Uh, same is true for soil and animal environment like our own guts. So the conclusions are pretty stunning. Number one, Viruses numerically dominate the biosphere. Every single living cell on this planet um, is matched by at least 10, more likely 100 virus particles. And not only are they numerically prevalent, they also, uh, they're also genetically extremely diverse. So the more we look into viral genomes, analyze and discover new viral genes, more we see that actually the metagenome of all viruses, combined number of unique genes and viruses, is way larger than that number in cells and organisms. So with this realization, next slide. Uh, of course, we're interested to understand what this variety of viruses comes from, uh, how did they emerge in the history of life, and so on. So, of course, seeing is believing, and because of that, the first uh, instinct of a scientist is to look at that creature, 
descriptor in this case, and to see the various particles of variance. And when you look at the variety of these particles, it is again staggering. Uh, many viruses are a sahedral sphere, right? Some of them are related to each other, others are not. But on top of that, there are elongated viruses, there are complex viruses, uh, like uh, bacteriophages at the bottom, and many other shapes, uh, some of which are uh, even funny, like brick shaped, uh, fox viruses, bullet shaped, raptor viruses, and this evil worm in the corner is, of course, the ball. Uh, my favorite shape is bubble shape, it's one of the archaeal viruses. So, um, anyway, this first look at this uh, morphosphere, as I call it. Next slide immediately suggest that classifying viruses and understanding their evolution, looking uh, pretty much at the morphology of viruses, is uh, not a good idea. And this analysis should be accompanied by analysis of entire gene content of entire viral genomes. And it's called phylogenomics, and it's called um, systemic biology and network analysis. So I'll go through some major advances in this field with you and hope to convince you that we are making now revolutionary progress in this field. Next slide, please. So uh, I am starting with a bird's view of virus replication and genome expression side. So we all, cellular organisms, eukaryotes, whatever, uh, cellular life you look at are the same. Our genomes are double-stranded DNA, which are transcribed into RNA and translated into proteins. And that is a uniform genetic cycle of all cellular organisms. It's just one genetic cycle. If you look at viruses, there are seven of those. Three are based entirely on RNA. So this virus is uh, classes 1, 2, 3 have no idea that DNA ever existed. They only use RNA, the genetics and the genome expression. Now there are two classes of weird viruses which go through their replication starting with RNA, then turning it into DNA, that's reverse transcription, including HIV or VIH in Russian. Um, and uh, viruses which start with DNA, then go through RNA and back to DNA. And finally, there are double-stranded and single-stranded DNA viruses. So why this variety? Next slide. The simplest idea and most writing idea is that. Oh, sorry. Something. Oh, can we go back to the slide? I just uh, forgot that. I read it. So what I was going to talk about, that this diversity immediately suggests a simple idea that um, the uh, diversity comes from a melting pot of, uh, of life's evolution. When all of the types of genetic information processing, including RNA, DNA, reverse transcription, were available, and it suggests that viruses arose at those ancient uh, phases in life's evolution. This is a simple idea, and uh, uh, it's a first, uh, first take on uh, evolution of viruses. And basically, this is, uh, next slide shows um, what uh, is a virus classification based simply on genome replication cycle. Uh, I called it virus word 101. In the United States, 101 means introductory class. So it's the simplest take on uh, classification of viruses. And I will finish my talk with something like that, but a way more sophisticated in terms of analysis and uh, scientific power behind this classification. So uh, what we got here is double-stranded DNA viruses, single-stranded DNA viruses, positive strand, negative strand, double-strand RNA viruses, and reverse transcribing viruses. So that's the entire virus world. And um, this is a formal classification, and this uh, different ovals uh, combining different viruses look isolated. 
but in fact they're all interconnected. And how this entire virus work is all together is based on a uh, genome, virus genome analysis, which has many different gene categories, next slide please, of which uh, the most important uh, is viral hallmark genes. And actually we have introduced this term uh, 10 years ago, almost to the day. So the paper has been released on September 19, 2006. So 10 years from now, I'm proud to say that our concepts are not only in play, but they're nothing but strengthened by 10 years of evolutionary development in evolutionary biology. So, uh, what are viral hallmark genes? Those are special category of genes which are shared by many diverse virus groups. These genes possess only very distant homologs uh, in cellular genomes. Mm -hmm. And they play major roles in uh, phases of viral duplication, genome packaging and uh, particle assembly. So vital virus specific functions. So altogether these genes can be viewed as distinguishing characters of so called virus stage. And for us being a virus means possessing at least one or maybe several of those genes. So what are they? Next slide. I just give you two, a few examples. One is a structural protein, so-called general capsid protein, which can be found in uh, uh, an astonishing variety of viruses, in small RNA viruses, in huge DNA viruses, all over the map. Uh, another example is replicational enzyme, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is unique to viruses. There is only one type of similar enzyme in cells, which is non-homologous to viral enzyme. So this enzyme is uh, very closely related to reverse transcriptase, which is RNA-dependent DNA. So just a couple of examples. But the next one is my favorite example is this. It's so-called superfamily 3 helicase, which is an enzyme which unwinds uh, viral RNA or DNA during and it belongs to a very large uh, class of proteins called P-loop antibases. And uh, at that side, you have a phylogenetic tree which shows primarily cellular members of this uh, class of proteins. But one branch, uh, this one, belongs to viruses. As you see, it doesn't belong to any cellular organism. And it goes in evolution beyond this red line. Red line corresponds to LUCA, which is last universal common ancestor of all cells. So this evolutionary study demonstrated without little doubt that this particular enzyme doesn't come from the cell. So forget about this old theories of viruses originated from simplified parasitic cells never happen. Viruses does originate from pre-cellular phase in life's history. Okay? So obviously there was genetics and evolution before cells. We cannot possibly imagine that cells popped up with uh, their complicated membrane system and so on and so forth from nothing. Next slide. Again, this is a 10 years old diagram I developed for that same paper. But uh, again, this is holding true with all of that new acquired knowledge. So in brief, what happened? It all started with RNA work. RNA is the best molecule, first biological evolving molecule for one simple reason. It's the only one which can combine enzymatic function with template can repeat itself, basically. In theory, in lab, we only succeeded in making like a few dozen nucleotide long sequences using primers. But anyway, uh, do we see any remnants so evolutionary analogies of this RNA work? Yes, that's selfish uh, group one introns, which have ribosome activity, viroids of plants, and so on and so forth. So 
that work is long extinct. The next phase is life evolution. Has been invention of ribosome, which is kind of a mystery. We can talk for hours about that, and proteins, of course. And we do have systems which live, still live in this RNA protein world. That's RNA viruses. Right? Next phase, you can only make small genome from RNA. It's relatively fragile. To grow a more sophisticated large genome you need a different carrier or template for storage of genetic information, which is key. And the, work, uh, the way to switch from RNA to DNA is reverse transcription. Once again, found now only in viruses and other genetic parasites called retroprotons positives. And uh, when the DNA work emerged with a little help of reverse transcriptase, then um, accretion of genes into larger genomes, which could combine enough genes to make a cell, it's about a thousand. So uh, all of the recent evolutionary studies uh, quite convincingly demonstrated that independently living cell, bacterial or kill cell, needs about a thousand genes. So when this became possible, uh, two types of organisms, cellular organisms, have originated, which are bacteria and archaea, which have homologous uh, translation system, but non-homologous, heterologous uh, uh, DNA replication and And at every phase of virus, uh, sorry, of life evolution, parasitic elements were there, and even mathematical modeling um, indicates that. If you have a system of replicators, error prone replication, it will inevitably be evolving and generating parasitic elements or chillers, they are called in mathematical. So viruses were not only inevitable from the very early stages of life, but they always accompanied life and they were always an element of uh, jet lag. Uh, if I fell asleep, uh, please don't blame me. It was very long Pennsylvania flight from West Coast. Anyway, so they are co-evolving with life systems. And recently we have plenty of, um, plenty of information to support the idea that not only they coexisted and affected life evolution, but provided plenty of elements without which life would not exist. Just one example, uh, eukaryotes. All our chromosomes uh, have telomeres. Telomeres are responsible for replicating ends of chromosomes, which are, would be shrinking uh, without those. The key enzyme of uh, telomere replication is telomerase, which is a viral reverse transcriptase. Of course, it has been borrowed from virus or virus-like uh, parasitic element and then adopted by eukaryotic life to support linear chromosome duplication. Just one example. Uh, but such examples are multiple and actually uh, very large. I'm not even delving into this part. It would take uh, a dozen of lectures in its own right. Next slide. So, how about eukaryotic viruses? If you compare all viruses of prokaryotes, which is bacteriophages, and viruses of archaea, right? And you compare all of the viruses of eukaryotes, you immediately see that these are two different worlds. You cannot say that this particular virus of eukaryotes is a direct descendant uh, of particular bacteriophage, for example. It just doesn't work this way. However, some interesting, uh, interesting connections has been found, and I'll be talking about uh, what happened is that if we buy into the most uh, supported uh, theory of eukaryogenesis, emergence of eukaryotic cell, which is uh, archaeal host, archaeal cell, which played host to bacterial and the symbiont. And that's uh, undeniable because all eukaryotes possess organelles called 
mitochondria, graph, and this are simply alpha proteobacteria, uh, type of bacteria which exists today. We know that for sure because mitochondria have genomes, at least most of them do, and their genomes are homologous to alpha proteobacteria. So uh, it's difficult to argue that uh, eukaryotic cell is an symbiotic origin based on archaeal information processing system. Our translation, replication, transcription is more similar to archaeal than to bacterial. The rest of biochemistry is bacterial. So basically it's a fused and a symbiont. And viruses, uh, I'll show you a few examples, but generally eukaryotic viruses can be conceptualized as originated by mixing and matching of genes from different origins, primarily from bacteriophages and bacteria themselves. And I'll show you a few illustrations of that mechanism of virus uh, evolution. So, last year uh, we published this paper uh, which uh, specifically focuses on evolution of eukaryotic viruses. And um, uh, it was a pleasure to work on this paper because previously some of our ideas looked uh, maybe engaging for uh, people with imagination but had little basis in hard science, I mean bioinformatics and statistics. And now, um, our hypothesis uh, find more and more uh, support and foundation in those particular exact sciences, I mean statistics and bioinformatics. So, the most striking observation of comparing viruses of prokaryotes and eukaryotes is that uh, they are contrast. The genomes, most of them, vast majority of the bacteriophages and archaeal viruses are DNA viruses. Okay? We don't even know a single RNA virus of archaea and only a handful of RNA bacteriophages. In contrast, RNA viruses are extremely abundant in uh, eukaryotes, including human population. And uh, it is uh, no uh, surprised that most of these emerging diseases uh, are RNA viruses or re reverse transcribing viruses which actually have RNA in their genomes anyway. So, next slide. i just give you one example which is not exactly new. We published this paper in 08. This paper has been focused on a particular large supergroup or superfamily of RNA viruses called picornaviruses, okay? like poliovirus, foot and mouth disease virus, and many others, but that is A. So uh, what we have discovered uh, by spending a year looking into these viruses is shown on this um, phylogenetic diagram. So all of this large viral superfamily fell into six major evolutionary lineages or clades. And of course, you cannot read all of these branches uh, unless you go into the paper and read it carefully. But you can immediately see that in many of those clades, in most of them, with the exception of clade 6, you see several <coughs> excuse me, lines of several different colors. And this diagram is, uh, is color-coded. So plants are green, of course, and some other supergroups of um, uh, eukaryotes are shown in different colors. So each, with single exception of this clade, has at least two and often three different eukaryotic supergroups. Meaning very simple thing. If you have this evolutionary lineage and you see that viruses in this lineage are relatively closely related to each other, but in fact very evolutionary remote organisms, you immediately suggest that these viruses evolved before those uh, host organisms evolutionarily separating from each other. There are other explanations. We can talk about those, but those explanations are much less uh, simple and convincing. So this uh, evolutionary analysis immediately suggested very ancient 
origin of this uh, superfamily of RNA viruses at the time of eukaryogenesis. So next slide. And of course, we were interested to understand where the major genes of the coronaviruses come from. And a couple of cases are not as clear cut. For example, capsid proteins, by the way, viral hallmark gene in this small genome. Uh, most likely originate from single-stranded DNA bacteriophages, but phylogeny of this protein is very difficult to follow at this scale because they evolve fast. They are not very well conserved except for tertiary structures. Uh, now, superfamilies Vihiligase, my favorite viral hormone drug, another one, most likely originates from single-stranded DNA plasmids of the bacteria. But most striking origin has been discovered for uh, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. We would expect that this enzyme, because this enzyme is only found in bacteriophages, as I said, a handful of RNA bacteriophages, that this RDRP of poliovirus would also be evolutionary connected to that enzyme. No way. Instead, we have discovered that the closest relative of this RDRP is reverse transcriptase, especially from group 2 introns of bacteria and archaea. Group 2 introns are introns which replication cycle their genetic parasites. Their replication cycle based on reverse transcription. So uh, the last uh, signature gene of the coronaviruses is 3C protease. And with this gene, there is absolutely no doubt that it originated from bacterial uh, and mitochondrial proteases. So what we have here, exactly as I said in the beginning, mixing and matching of genes of different origins, uh, bacterial parasites, retro elements, and bacterial genome itself, or mitochondrial genome. Uh, it's impossible to distinguish because, yes, mitochondria originate from that. So that was a strong case toward supporting our concept of, um, of emergence of eukaryotic viruses. <laughs> Excellent case. Just to complete this theme, uh, what you see here, those uh, five sectors of different colors are five supergroups of eukaryotic organisms. And we are here, Simpson is my favorite human being, so animals and vertebrates are here, fungi, amoebas, and all over the place, plants are there, from all the lights are here. Uh, so you may see easily that red arrows denoting different lineages of the coronaviruses are all over the place, except for uh, Rosaria. But that's probably because nobody ever looked into these creatures for viruses. So, as I said from the first diagram on coronaviruses, this supports a very simple idea that these viruses where the all eukaryotic organisms came to be. And alternative is horizontal virus transfer which is next to impossible considering different ecological niches and lifestyles of all of these viruses. Next slide. So uh, this diagram from that same paper of last year deserves probably a couple of hours of going through every branch and transition. I don't have that amount of time, so I just give you a major idea. We have prokaryotic viruses, and we have bacterial cell. So one major uh, pathway of virus evolution is located here, where ancestral cucurnal-like virus came to be. And from this virus, we have one branch coming to the coronavirus superfamily, which I have covered. And others, I can provide you some support for this idea. Others come to alpha virus superfamily, flavivirus superfamily, and what is also interesting, it's not new, uh, it has been discussed in many previous papers, double-stranded RNA viruses seem to assess 
polyphyletic origin, meaning that they arose more than once from different lineages of positive strand RNA viruses, with one exception. Real viruses appear to originate directly from sister breeder bacteriophages with similar genomes and similar architecture of virus particles. That's just one branch. Major branches here. And this branch evolved into all existing positive strand viruses of eukaryotes and majority of double-stranded viruses. Most exciting, um, most exciting development in this field was um, understanding that negative strand RNA viruses like influenza are closely related to positive strand RNA viruses. And that is based on the similarity in the structure of the T enzyme RNA dependent RNA polymerase. This is hepatitis C virus, a flavor virus. Uh, positive strand RNA. And this is influenza. Right? So they're almost uh, identical in terms of their structure. So, hypothesis of where minus strand RNA viruses like influenza came from is very simple. From positive strand RNA viruses of this flavivirus superfamily, and I can talk at length about how and when that happened. We have a pretty good idea now. But anyway, this pretty much covers most of the known positive strand RNA viruses. And what is also very satisfying, this new discoveries, those novel viruses almost inevitably fell in one of those categories. So we are pretty close to actually filling all of the gaps in understanding RNA virus evolution. I may also have mentioned briefly this lineage because it does come straight from RNA bacteriophages. A couple of relatively small and isolated families of RNA viruses of eukaryotes do originate from bacteriophages. Next slide. So, how about reverse transcribing viruses, including HIVs? Well, after we understood the evolution of reverse transcriptase, it's not our work, um, it's work from other lab. Uh, so they looked at evolutionary tree of all the reverse transcriptases known today. Well, most of them. And the picture is pretty clean and simple. We have a large evolutionary variety of different parasitic elements which replicate through reverse transcription. And most diverse of those are on the top, bacterial and archaeal uh, retrotransposons of group 2 introns and some others. I'm not going to do that. In eukaryotes, you have huge variety of different types of reverse transcribing elements called retrotransposons and related elements. And viruses represent only a small, relatively small fraction in this large evolutionary diagram. Viruses are here. And they are closely related, as you can see, thank you, with retrotransposons. Okay? So here we have plant pararetroviruses and retroviruses themselves. And as you see, they're in the same branch as gypsy retrotransposons, elements which are peppering the genomes of many, many different eukaryotes, including our own. But these guys, even though they're called metaverida, meta means like viruses. They're not viruses. They're not infections, even though they form acids. Anyway, um, next slide, please. I can support this idea by comparing genome of HIV, or which, uh, with a genome of typical uh, retrotransposon called gyps gypsy. Uh, capsid proteins are homologous. This block of replication and integration uh, is very similar between these two creatures. Uh, protease, uh, reverse transcriptase, RNAs, H integrase. And even envelope gene, uh, at least GP120, of HIV is homologous to an old protein of this replicant. So the evolutionary conclusion is very straightforward. Uh, positive, sorry, 
uh, reverse transcribing viruses originated from retro transposons by acquiring ability to infect, by evolving more sophisticated structures, promoting cell-to-cell uh, -cell transfer, organism-to-organism -organism transfer. Next slide. So now I'm deviating a little bit from my major topic, which is general understanding of virus origins and evolution, and venturing into the history of HIV which has been discovered, I mean, the people sick with AIDS were first uh, identified in 1982 in uh, New York and San Francisco. Most of these people were homosexuals, and um, that's because of the sexual transmission of this virus. Later on, in basically a couple of years, the virus has been discovered and sequenced. It's HIV, as we know, know. And there was a big rivalry between Lopin and Yef from France and Robert Gallo from US who, um, who, who discovered this virus independently, but that's a very complicated story I'm not going into. So, um, relatively short time between identification of a novel disease, novel virus, and uh, understanding the infectious agents and its genome. So, where this Horrible disease comes from. Of course, it comes from Africa. All people originate in Africa in this area, and HIV also originates from Africa from this area. And now, with all of the uh, tremendous field work done in African jungle uh, and all of the lab studies and phylogenetic studies, we can say uh, with uh, certainty that HIV. Human virus originates from virus of chimpanzees. Uh, this virus is called simian, uh, immunodeficiency virus. So um, in this area where HIV actually crossed uh, the species barrier was transmitted from apes, chimpanzee in the first place, to humans, uh, we see uh, the uh, largest populations of chimpanzees, of course, and uh, all of that. Uh, all of the genetic diversity of the originating virus uh, from chimpanzees. The way of conspicuous transmission we may never know. There could be several ones. One of the possibilities is so-called bushmeat markets where apes and any other thing which moves and can be eaten uh, is butchered and sold uh, for food. So those treating uh, the carcasses of chimpanzees could be easily infected through blood transmission by cuts and other injuries. Next slide. So more uh, deep investigation of phylogeny of HIV and SIV demonstrated with certainty that particular strains of chimpanzee virus gave rise to several branches of HIV including so-called pandemic group M, which represents most of the HIV viruses found throughout the globe now. Uh, next slide, please. So the end result is shown here all over the world, and most of the variety of HIV is found in sub-Saharan Africa. Right here, you see all of the colors in this area where chimpanzee lives. And uh, when transmission occurred between different continents, what happened is particular subtypes of this uh, group M are dominating, uh, say, in Europe uh, and in Americas. Uh, it's subtype B in, uh, in South Africa, South Asia, it's subtype C, and so on and so forth. Okay. Next slide. So, the end result of this globalization of AIDS uh, pandemic is 30 million people dead and over 60 million people infected. And uh, it is no secret here that Ukraine is hard hit by HIV epidemics and AIDS epidemics recently. We see plenty of papers in scientific journals and uh, magazines about that epidemics. And um, I would like to complete this discourse into HIV history 
by diagram which is of my own development. So that is my vision of how and why this pandemics and other pandemics of viruses including uh, Zika uh, emerge. The heart of the issue is so-called environmental catastrophe. You can <clears throat> also call it civilization, human activity. What happens, normal habitat of different animals, including chimpanzees, is shrinking and population is reduced. Okay? That's because the land is cultivated, jungle is burned down, and used for plantations or mining or whatnot. So with uh, shrinking population size, uh, Darwin evolution is in place and you know that we are uh, evolving relatively slowly because of purifying selection. Those variants which are not very well fit are wiped away by evolution. But when the population shrinks, genomic variability dramatically increases. That's inevitable because everything which can reproduce survives. Competition goes down and all of the variation goes up. With this variation, cross-species transmission becomes easier. Plus, the exposure of the humans to apes is increased because, well, previously few people lived in the area uh, being exposed to chimpanzees. Now, lots of people work in the jungle, eliminated, eat apes, uh, and so on and so forth. That uh, resulted in uh, more sophisticated uh, ways of transmission between humans uh, which evolved in HIV and that's the end result. Endangered species to humans just because of the laws of evolution and human civilization development. That's my take on HIV history. And if you take any other virus, be it Ebola, be it Zika, you will see very, very soon. After that deviation, I would really quick go through amazing discovery in virology because I have uh, not much time left, actually, no. Uh, so, uh, I'm talking about giant viruses. Uh, some of them were known for some time, like box viruses. Others were discovered uh, a few years ago, like mimivirus, which has the uh, particle size larger than smallest bacteria and Pandora virus, which is even bigger, which have uh, 2,500 genomes. Remember I told that smallest cell, which would be autonomous, viable, needs just 1,000. So this genome is comparable to simplest eukaryotic genomes. So uh, the story about viruses being small and simple is over. Viruses could be as complex or more complex than cells. And of course, this uh, discovery revitalized the hypothesis of virus origin from cells. And uh, this hypothesis just doesn't make any sense, as I will show you in a few next slides next. Phylogenetic studies demonstrate that all of this variety of giant viruses share a core, genomic core, evolutionary core of about 50 genes. Next slide. And these genes are nothing special for viruses because many of those are viral hallmark genes. Remember I told you virus is what has a hallmark gene. And this virus, even with all of the huge complication uh, of the genome, uh, still obeys this rule. We have general capsid protein, major protein here, we have super family 3 helicase, remember that, and a few others. So other genes were, were acquired from other viruses, eukaryotic host, bacteriophages, and whatnot. But anyway, this virus, even as impressive as it is, is still a normal virus and not the fourth domain of life like some, uh, some suggest. Next slide. So, uh, the summary of DNA virus evolution of eukaryotes is shown here. It's last year's uh, release, uh, this figure. The most amazing thing about it is that, once again, 
we found multiple connections of genetic parasites, in this case, pelotons, to largest group of eukaryotic DNA viruses, including this giant viruses called megaviralis, adenoviruses, uh, and, uh, and others. So at least two different evolutionary lineages, one coming from bacteriophages in Tectivirida, Tectivirida through polyntons, those transposons basically, which uh, has been now confirmed to contain capsid proteins. So there is no, absolutely no strict order between viruses and capsid last genetic elements like transposons or heterotransposons. There are transposons with capsids, there are viruses without capsids, so this is one virus world. All of the genetic paradise, uh, parasites unite. Okay, it's not Marx. It's me. Now, uh, what we have here is this lineage is coming to uh, giant viruses and many others, including um, adenoviruses. And there is another lineage is coming from tailed bacteriophages, so called the viralis, or herpes viruses, and so on and so forth. But this is again, it's something like intuitive map based on uh, basically handwriting. So we've generated this diagram showing different genes common for different virus families. But most recent news from the shop of my friend and long-term collaborator, Eugene Kunin, is shown on the next slide. So this is a big deal, trust me on that one. Instead of developing this uh, concept of virus evolution, on the basis of our intuition and some facts from phylogenetic studies. This is uh, the last word in this field. It's a network analysis. Oh, sorry. Uh, I didn't check this slide. Uh, it's screwed up. The title is screwed up. That's what your PC does to my Mac presentation. Anyway, uh, it's a bipartite network statistical analysis of DNA viruses of you. What this means? Every color circle represents a virus or viral genome. Okay? Every dot, like black dot or brownish dot, represents virus gene. So it's like two networks overlapping each other. One is viruses, their genomes, another genes found in these genomes. So that's a way to interpret virology these days, so at least viruses. What you see here is this complex hierarchical network in which you see large uh, clusters and these clusters are uh, viruses which are most closely related to each other again showing the genes which are found in majority on all of these viruses. Okay? So say you see this large uh, big uh, formation in here which includes uh, tailed bacteriophages, which are majority of viruses on this planet. And as I already suggested, uh, viruses which are related to those, like giant viruses, you will see it on the next slide. And there are, sorry, previous one. And there are also um, some branches which are pretty remote, like archaeal viruses and small DNA viruses, which are very, uh, very loosely connected to this large cluster. And polyntons, this transposons are here, and again, they're quite well connected to different eukaryotic viruses. So, this is uh, now virus world 201, advanced uh, rendering of understanding of virus evolution, because this is not our intuition, this is statistics. Okay? And what is important, I'll mention it at the end of my talk, is that now, viral hallmark genes, our, so to speak, revelation, uh, 10 years ago, is a statistical term. Basically, these genes are not our imagination. These genes are genes which are statistically most frequently found in viruses. Okay? And there is a number behind it, point zero one. That's a, uh, that's a uh, probability with which this virus genes are connecting different nodes and clusters in this entire network of virus evolution. 
So, just a couple of slides left. Uh, keep up with me next, please. It's just a close up on one of the clusters. Again, you see polyptons, DNA transposons, which gave rise to adenoviruses, giant viruses, and somewhat more uh, remote baculoviruses and others. So, this just shows that more detailed analysis of network has been done when you focus on some particular cluster of this network. So, there is no single evolutionary tree for viruses, forget it. However, there is this network analysis which is the best next uh, to tree. Even tree of life, cellular uh, life, is a kind of difficult proposition. Again, it's network because of horizontal evolutionary transfers. Genes are transferred from one cell to another. In viruses, this process is rampant. And as I already indicated, same gene can be found in smallest RNA virus and largest DNA virus. So for viruses, there is not a single gene which is present in all of them. So forget about the evolutionary theory of viruses. But network is statistically supported, significant view of virus evolution. Next slide. So I would like to conclude with a very simple statement. The mysteries of virus origins can be revealed. And I am extremely happy to declare that because 10 years ago it wasn't quite clear if we ever will be able to understand virus evolution with any certainty and precision of statistical analysis. Now we do. And that's a miracle. Now, um, chimeric origins of virus genomes where the morphogenetic and genome replication models are derived from distinct ancestor is one of the striking features of this concept of virus work. Tight evolutionary connections between encapsulated viruses and capsidless selfish elements. So they are fluid. Uh, transposons can give rise to viruses and vice versa. It's the same virus work. You cannot separate it. And um, in the double-stranded uh, DNA viruses, uh, the networks exhibit robust hierarchical modularity with some modules combined diverse viruses infecting bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes, cells from all three domains of life, strongly supporting our initial concept of virus work. And finally, the hallmark genes which keep together this entire virus work are now defined as connector genes of higher prevalence, maintaining the integrity of this entire evolutionary network. So with this I would like to acknowledge my uh, collaborators. Next slide please. Eugene Kunin, uh, old friend of mine. Uh, we worked on virus evolution together for decades. He is now at NIH and I'm joining him later this fall to complete the book we are working uh, on. And uh, Bit younger genius. By the way, Eugene has been elected to National Academy this year, which I am very proud of. And Mark Trupovich, he is from Lithuania. He is a young genius who is now helping Eugene and I a lot with discerning different evolutionary pathways, viruses. So he is another you know, co-author of the book we are working. With this, I would like to close, and I don't know if I will allow any questions, because I am late. Sorry for that. But if questions are allowed, you are welcome to ask not only in English, but in Russian and Ukrainian. I am from Zaporozhye, Kozak, so I understand.